next talk will be in English, and Jack will speak to introduce the next speaker in English. Um, we had a not so private conversation with Michael's on, but uh, we just found out we're neighbors. <laughs> and um, the reason why I ask this is because I asked him a few questions uh, before um, uh, to, to prepare for the introduction. And he told me he has a, a, a son, Olaf, and, uh, yeah, Olaf. Hola, uh, yeah. one and a half years old. And uh, he said, you can sometimes find me walking in my onesie with him in a car. <laughs> That's interesting. So I said, where do you live? And he said, Amsterdam. I said, oh, we're in Amsterdam. He said, this and that. I said, I'll be there too. <laughs> so I'm going to be on the lookout for the next few weeks. <laughs> no pictures, please. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> uh, no pictures, please. Uh, well, pictures are allowed now here that yeah. you're on yeah. stage, so people can take pictures. Um, uh, Edward Semang, Dr. Edward Semang. Uh, he specialized in neuromarketing and he works for a company, Neuroprise. And um, when he doesn't do that, you can find him on his fire blade. That's apparently his motorbike. Are you the one that goes through our area? has got to run around and when it, there's not a reason. No. Okay. No. That's not me. Definitely not me. Okay. Um, but when he's not doing that, he's working on neuromarketing and he specialized in uh, WooCommerce websites. That what you, that's what you do, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, sort of, yeah. So, sort of. And you use uh, actually uh, neuromarketing to in increase conversion. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to find out what that means. Um, originally, you were a backup speaker. You were floating yeah. in the last minute. So how many of you put your name up on the board for Barcamp tomorrow? No one inspired to do a talk? I know there's one. Uh, four on the board. Four on the board, any of you? Everyone can be here and speak. You all get a story. Yeah. So feel inspired. I mean, if we can be here, you can be here. Um, but first, uh, let's hear Ajax uh, talk about uh, neuromarketing. And the official title is How to Boost Your Client's Conversion with Neuropsychology. So big applause for Peter. Thank you. Thank you for being here. The title is How to boost your client's conversion with neuropsychology, but this could also be about your own website, about your own web shop. Um, so you can apply it to your customer's website, you can apply it to your own website. Uh, you could even tell to your boss that he needs to do this or that. Um, so let's start. What are we going to do today? I'm going to give you a brief introduction about myself. I think that some of you know who I am. It's not my first time that I do a talk at WordCamp Nijmegen. I was here last year as well, and I did a talk at WordPress Meetup Nijmegen. Um, then I'm going to tell you a bit about the brain, because if you don't know anything about the brain, it's difficult to apply persuasion principles into on your own website, on the websites of your customers, on the Facebook ads that you're creating for them. So we, 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 I'm not. you're just going to get your big toe wet, that's all. Um, then we're going to dive into six persuasion principles that you can apply to websites, to a Facebook campaign, to anything. And we're going to end with a Q&A. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, you could also save it up for the end of the presentation. So, Neurofight, that's where I work. My name is Evert Semein, I did a PhD, and I co-founded Neurofight uh, this year, January 1st, with Bag and Ben Barra. Uh, he's the strategist of our company. Um, Ian, who is in the back of the room, also works with us, Ian McCorkadale. Uh, he's a neuropsychologist, and within our team, he's really the scientist. He reads the articles, scientific findings and translate that into Yip and Yannicka language so that <laughs> you who don't know anything about it understand what the new findings are, how you can apply it to your website, to your marketing strategy plan. Um, and we have Denise Jans also working with us as a volunteer and she is a neuroscientist uh, doing her PhD as well and she also um, translates science into Yip and Yannicka. Uh, some of the companies that we've worked with, Afterpay, uh, True, LabFresh, um, and we do several stuff for them. Uh, for Afterpay, we did a workshop, we, we taught them neuromarketing, and we also um, 
improve their email workflow. So if you're a customer of them and you get emails from them, big chances are that they were optimized by our company. So the brain. We humans, if, if you want to have a good understanding about the brain, we need to go back uh, roughly four to five bill, million, what is it, million years, because that's when our brain, that's where the origin of our brain lies. Uh, during that time, there were tigers, saber-toothed tigers, there were mammoths, and it was a dangerous time. So our brain did one thing, and that was directing our behavior. We were all aimed at survival. So if you saw a mammoth coming from the right and a saber-toothed tiger on the left, your brain made a calculation which one is more dangerous and made you move in the safest direction. In evolution, we changed a bit. But our brain did not change as you might think it did. We kept our old brain and a new part grew on top of the old brain. So you basically have one part your old part that is directing your behavior, and you have a different part that, that that's what defines us from, from um, animals, um, that helps you with planning, doing shopping, um, having a chat with your friends. And uh, Daniel Kahneman, the only psychologist that received a Nobel Prize um, research, research on those two parts, and named them System 1 and System 2. System 1 is the unconscious system. Um, system, system 2 is the conscious system. And um, just to give you a number, roughly 95, could be more, could be a bit less, but almost 95% of the decisions that you make every day, even right now, are made by System 1. So the subconscious system. You're not aware of choices that you're making. It could be the sandwich that you picked up during lunch, or the drink that you picked when uh, uh, the, the break that we had right now. System two is the conscious system. Um, makes you rationalize the thing. Why did you pick the green blouse or the green sweater that you're wearing right, right now? System two is going to rationalize that why you picked that. And you may think that that's a good match. Two systems, they communicate with each other. System one tells system two what the plans are. System two does the same thing back to system one. But that's the most annoying part. They don't communicate with each other. There are two black boxes. So if there is a conflict, if, you're going to, if you need to make a decision, and you have system one and system two working on that decision, there is always a winner. And most of the time, that's system one. Why? Because system one is directing your behavior. And most decisions are behaviors. Even purchase something is a behavior. So most of the time system one wins when there's a conflict. So directing your marketing to the system two, to the system two which is the conscious system, could not be that efficient because system one has a bigger chance of winning the decision-making process. Um, oh, there's a different slide. I thought it was another one. Um, so you have a, uh, a hair, I think it is in English, and a turtle in your head, and system one, the green system, is... Um, uh, was it this one? No, I'm sorry. Slides are gone. Um, uh, so it's, it's th the most important thing to understand is that system one is most of the time the winner. And there's a second reason why system one most of the time wins uh, a decision, and that's processing speed. The processing speed of system two, the conscious system, is 40 bits per second. Does anyone want to make a guess about the processing system, processing speed of system one, subconscious system? Anyone? Is it 5,000? Okay. Are oh, you close? But the processing speed of system one is 11 million bits per second. It's a measurement. <laughs> 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 
It's, it's, it's a rough indicator of the speed of processing your brain. It's not, you can't compare it to anything, but if you translate it to computer speed, mm -hmm. then 11 million bits can pass through system one, compared to 40, bit, 40 bits that can be processed by system two. So it's mainly to show you that there are two main reasons why system one, the subconscious system, is a good system to target in your marketing, but also when you're building a website. Because system one processes your website immediately and makes decisions about it. Do I like it or not? And am I going to purchase this or not? Do I like the checkout process or not? So targeting and making sure that system one likes your website, likes your Facebook advertisement, likes your newsletter is important. Um, some other facts about the brains. Um, these are our modern brains. They roughly weigh 2% of our body weight, 1.4 kilo. That's where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Minus 1.4. <laughs> but they roughly weigh 2% of your total body weight, but they consume 20% of your caloric intake. So. It's a really important organ. There is a lot of things happening in the background. Um, um, and that's what you can see by the caloric intake. Um, so what, what I really want to discuss with you, and, and this was the bit, I'm not going to tell you more about the brain, but I really want to discuss with you are cognitive biases. Um, are there any, any Dutch speakers here that don't know what cognitive, cognitive biases are? because we have the Dutch word is a, is a dank fout. Um, but cognitive biases are, are shortcuts that we all have in our brain. Our, our brain is a lazy organ. It, it prefers to not spend any energy on something. So if it has to make a decision, it will go for the least energy consuming decision. And that's, that's, um, uh, Basically, the function of cognitive bias, and some of them are irrational. This image shows you all the cognitive biases that there are. It's roughly 175, could be some less, some more, because some can be combined, some can be extracted into two cognitive biases, and I'm only going to discuss six with you. Because if I have to go through all of them with you, that will be a bit of over overflow. Uh, but the image is on Wikipedia. If you Google for cognitive, cognitive biases, you can find this and all the cognitive biases that there are with the description, with the research behind it. So if you're really interested in it, Wikipedia cognitive biases is a good um, uh, page to go to. Persuasion principles. Um, we're going to discuss six, and I'm going to start with processing fluency. Processing fluency is um, it's basically the ease which with information is processed. I could have made a more difficult sentence, but that would probably made it diff more difficult. It would increase the process. It would decrease the processing fluency. You want messages to be clear, images to be understand quickly. Um, uh, and you want things at the location where people expect it. So, to give you an example, um, this example is from the workshop that we gave at Sherlock. Um, we taught them a bit about neuromarketing and we analyzed their website. This is their FAQ section. One of the recommendations that we gave over here to increase the processing fluency is to have the text be aligned from left to right. Why we read from left to right? That's what our brain has learned. Words are put on paper from left to right. So reading sentences that are aligned to the right makes it difficult for our brain. This takes more energy to process. So our brain is more likely to say, oh, not going to spend any energy on this. I'm going to close it. And even if you look at the 
gets to the over here, our brain uses this rigid edge as marks. I've been here, so the next sentence is probably somewhere over here. If you do it like this, our brain can't work with that rigid line anymore. So it loses where it was when reading the sentence. So it could be as easy as using left-aligned text on your website to increase processing fluency. Another recommendation that we had with, uh, at, at Sherlock, Sherlock is an Amsterdam-based company. They're also in Rotterdam, and they have escape rooms, and you can book a room with them. Now, where would you expect a book now button? Anyone? I hear top right. Anyone else? Center of the screen. Under the logo. Exactly. And they put it on the bottom left. So why, why did you make this design? We did not make this. We did not make this, no. And I'm not saying, that's also, it's, it's good to understand, I'm not saying this is wrong, but if you want to increase the processing fluency of your website, make it easier to consume, you need to make sure that the content that you are putting on the website for your customer, for your client, or on your own website, is at a location where they expect it to be. So you told me that you expected the book now button in the center of the page or at the top right. So keep that in mind if you need to place a button somewhere on a page. Think where does the customer of your customer or the visitor of your customer expects this function to be. So one of the things that they are going to experiment with is moving the book now button to make the page easier to consume. Another persuasion principle is framing. And with framing, you can draw different conclusions from the same information. What you see over here is the WooCommerce logo on the left and the Magento logo on the right. They're the same software. You can sell products with it. It's e-commerce. It's an e-commerce solution. But if you're a WooCommerce user, you, would, you could say, well, Magento, no, it's too expensive to maintain the system. You must only use Magento when you have a big store. And if you're a Magento user, you would say, no, WooCommerce is this and that. But in the end, we all have the same knowledge of these systems. But we draw different conclusions with the same information. So what you could do with that, with framing, is, and this is from LabFresh, I'm actually wearing one, uh, LabFresh creates uh, shirts that are stain repellent. So you could say it's stain repellent. So if I spill red wine on it, it will not make any stains on it. That's also what you see on the image. This is a glass of red wine. So you could say it's stain re repellent. Then you are focusing on the stains. With the same information differently framed, you could also say never worry about stains. It's framed differently, but it's the same information that you have with a different conclusion. No, the same conclusion, I'm sorry. I switched them. Um, and that's also what you could do with wordings that your customer has on your website or wordings that you have on your website. Is your hosting cheap or is it quality hosting? Could be that it's the same hosting. If you want a lot of customers with a small budget, then cheap could be a good wording. If you want high-end customers, quality hosting could be a good wording. If you're offering or selling something high-end, you may not want to use the word cheap. So you can play with the words to put a different frame that the visitor will see. The peak end rule. I, I like this rule because it's, it's a difficult one, but it's also a fun one. Uh, and there is an IKEA hot dog on the screen with a reason. Because one of the best examples to explain you the peak end rule is by using IKEA. Your walk through the IKEA magazine, uh, the, the warehouse, sorry. The, the, there goes my English. <laughs> 
Um, it's quite a long walk to the, to the warehouse. There is a dotted line that you can follow. It's always annoying. You have kids jumping on the bed. You have parents sitting on couches with their feet right where you want to put your feet. It takes you 20 minutes to go to the cupboard that you want. That nice white, you know, everyone has that cupboard. And you need to write down the path where it is. So 44A shelf. 30, you're happy at that moment because you found it, you know where it is. You continue your stroll, too slow, too much people, and then you put it on your cart, you get to the checkout, and you buy a hot dog. One euro. So you have two peaks. No, one peak. Sorry. One peak, that's that you found it. And you got the end, the hot dog. And with the peak, Andrew says that it's not about the complete experience. <laughs> it doesn't matter that it took you an hour and a half to buy that cupboard. It's about the average of the peak, so you found it, and the end. What could you do with that? Because you are not IKEA, and that's, that's clear to me. If, for instance, your customer or you are shipping up products, if something goes wrong, it's not about how long it takes for the customer to get the replacement product. It's about how good you handle the support. So show empathy. I'm sorry that it went wrong. That's the peak. And then you end with you're going to send a new one and it arrives. You could even add a present with it or give them discount for the next purchase. Then you made sure that the memory that they put into their brain, the experience that they had with you, was thumbed up. That's what you want. If you really want to, to you could be a pro with this because you can apply this on, on large scale, but you can also do this with sentences on your page as well. You can, you can apply the, the peak end rule to sentences, to paragraphs. So you, could do, you really could do a lot with this. The default effect. Sometimes default effect says that, that this is where the lazy brain comes in again. Um, when the choice that the brain has to make is arbitrary, so it doesn't really matter when I choose up, whether I choose option A or option B, we tend to go for the option that is pre-selected. That's the default effect. And this slide is from the workshop that we gave at Afterpay. And what you see over here is a customer of them that is offering their payment option as well. Um, but it's not selected at the default option. So chances are that in this checkout flow, the customer will select ideal as a checkout as payment method. So for your customer, if they, they prefer a specific checkout method, you could set that method as the default option, because you increase the chance that they will convert with that payment option. So that will look like this if you, for instance, want the customer to use Afterpay, which could be a good solution for you or your customer to use. Why? Yep, endowment effect. Um, endowment effect says that we tend to ask more uh, for when we have to give up an object than we are willing to pay for it. And with Afterpay, I'm not here to sponsor them, but with Afterpay or Klarna or there are several other payment methods that let you pay after you have received your product. Um, Chances are that your returns will decrease or the returns of your customer will decrease because of the endowment effect. Uh, do I have another? Yeah. So the decision that our brain makes is, do I want to keep my money or do I want to keep the service? The next one is the mere exposure effect. 
Um, our preferences and our positivity towards a brand increases if we are more familiar with it. So, for instance, on this image, there is a beer maker that you will all recognize. So what he's doing here is using the mirror exposure effect. If you, and what you can do with this to increase conversion is not only create uh, um, Facebook ads that are focusing on selling, or if you're doing this for yourself, not only focus on selling, but also focus on awareness. Because the more people see your brand, or the more people see the brand of your customer, the more positive and the more familiar they will get with that brand. And that will make them easier to convert. So if you run regular awareness campaigns that are not focused on selling, but just saying, hey, this is my brand, here I am, that will make those people that saw the ad easier to convert. And that's what you want. And you could also uh, look at email automation. Uh, if someone has bought a product, set them in a drip campaign. Tell them regularly about you. Tell them about the sale. Create an automation for your customer. That way, they will be easier to convert. You have to spend less money, less energy on them converting. They, they are familiar with your, they have seen something that you specified, they've seen your website, but it didn't do anything, so you're going, you're going to target them again. They're familiar, and that, that's often that results on retargeting are better than on the first campaign. I'm already at that point. It's, I'm on time, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, to recap, how could you boost conversion of your customer or your conversion with neuropsychology, apply processing fluency. Simple information is better processed. And, 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 and it's not, with processing fluency, it's not about text has to be short, but text, for instance, has to be easy to read. So don't use long sentences. Keep your sentences short. Use easy words. Um, don't try to, to throw uh, uh, too much difficult words in one paragraph. It's not about shortness, it's about simplicity. Framing, draw different conclusions from the same information. That was the WooCommerce versus Magento. They do the same, but, but you could draw different conclusions from the same information. They, Magento could be this, WooCommerce could be that. But are they really? Uh, the peak end rule, that was the IKEA rule, um, the hot dog at the end, and the cupboard that you find after the long walk. So it's not about the complete experience, it's about the average of the peaks and how it ended. The default effect, we tend to favor the default options. We have a lazy brain, so if the choice is arbitrary, we prefer to go for the one that was already selected. And the endowment effect, if we already have something um, with the, the, the payment solutions that you have to pay after you have received the product, you, returns decrease, people rather keep it after, before they have to pay. When they receive it before they have, have, they have to pay, uh, then when they have to pay first and then receive it later. And the mirror exposure effect, that Run an ad, cam an ad campaign about awareness. Um, make sure that your customer um, uh, has regular awareness campaigns running. Um, offer them email automation so that the familiar familiarity and the positivity with that brand increases. That's it. Any questions? Sorry, Monique. Start with applause. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, you have discussed uh, the issue of ethics frequently. Uh, it is on our blog. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would like to get uh, your, your view on that because there are obviously uh, 
the false, I might say. So could you, could you look at um, ethics in your, in your field? What's the, what's the question? Maybe I, I can give one uh, intro to it. So, of course, the brain is not static. Uh, it's actually grows in relation to its environment. And, for example, if you make things as easy as to say it's uh, stupid, less exciting, the brain becomes uh, less smart. So people get more childish from uh, having a lot of easy, stupid experiences. They become near consumers. Uh, but obviously, we do want the, the easiest uh, experience for your conversion. So there's a this, this and many other tension fields that are in applied neuroscience, right? So uh, could you give me your view on how you might try to balance these things? Yeah, so if, if I rephrase it, the, you're raising the question whether people get stupid if we apply neuropsychology and neuromarketing to anything. Well, well, that's one of the things, right? But also, get more conformed by, by neuroscience. But I, I don't want to give my opinion. I would like to get you. I'm interested in your opinion. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, you know your own opinion already, right? Yeah, and I do, I do. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> No, I think that the, to start with the ethic, is it, is it ethical neuromarketing? I think that could be one of your first questions. Is marketing ethical? We, we, we had a talk before the break. Basically, we, we are not doing anything differently. The only thing that we're doing is telling you why something works. With marketing, people know that something, something works. So you know that doing this results in that. And we only give you the why. Why does something work? Is that unethical? I don't think so. We are not, and we're also not, I can't force you, even if I put best neuromarketing effort in, I can't force you to buy anything that you don't want. I can't sell you a green car right now. Because you're not looking for that product. What we tend to do is that we make the choice of is there a product customer fit easier for the customer and also for the company itself we make it easier for them to decide does this customer fit into my target audience so we, we, we are not we're not it's not magic what that we're doing it's basically that we are we know the why of marketing methods and that's what we are applying. And we, we, so it's more for us, it's more we decide which tactic we are going to use because we can make an estimation of what works best in this situation. Does that answer your question? Is it a start? Uh, I, I, I do understand how you view that. Thing. Yeah, that's a good Thank you. Yeah, I'm very impressed by uh, the quality of your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, if you do the conversion for the legislation, I'm not going to do it alone, right? Yeah, I did. The, the question is, did, did you, there are several tricks that I applied. Did I apply any neuromarketing to my presentation? Yes, I did. How many did you recognize? How many, exactly, that would be my next question. How many did you? I recognize the exposure effects. I mean, neuropod is, is in many, many slides that you can know mm -hmm. um, More or less, um, I like the peak and blue because uh, um, the last last examples were more interesting than, uh, according to me, were more interesting than the three um, And the process is blue because that's, that's the quality of the presentation. I know yeah. exactly where it is, and it's standing very well. I think that, that it, um, we applied exactly processing fluency because, and, and, and it's not because we want to apply it, but I want this to be as easy for you to consume as possible. Because I want that, if you walk out that door, that you've learned at least two things. And I can, I can improve those chances by making it more, more easier for you. I didn't make it stupid. It's still pretty heavy stuff that I taught today. But I made it easier for you. So I apply processing fluency. Regarding the logos, you might have noticed that sometimes they were on the left, sometimes they were on the right. 
Um, could you correct me? It's not bizarreness effect, right? What was the the slight slight logo changes? There, there, there are, I'm, 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 there is, there is, if, if we, you, you notice subconsciously if there changes something. So your attention was subconsciously drawn to our logo. Um, there is, um, this, this is Nijmegen that you see in the background. So there's familiarity. Uh, the opening slide was exactly the color scheme of WordCamp Nijmegen. So yeah, I applied some tricks, but it was not to trick you. It was to make it feel you more at home, to make it easier to consume this information. You're more credible to adhere to your own uh, mechanism and your own theory. Yeah, but I also like to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I also recognize it, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I come from a graphical background, and you have the salt theory, like how you apply images and stuff like that to make it easier for people to read, how you stuff like that to write and stuff like that. So does this sort of like match to yourself? Is it sort of the same principles? Yeah. yeah. And and another thing before I'm still listening to this, I suddenly feel like thinking Coca Cola. Would you do that? So uh, they, they seem to do it in cinemas. Is, is no, that it, a true story? Or is no, it's, that a we, we, we actually have a blog post on that on our website um, about the Coca-Cola subliminal messaging is the correct wording. Uh, it's 90, 40, 50. I think it's 48, but I'm not sure. It, it could be 52. Um, there was one researcher that uh, showed the Coca-Cola logo in between the old movies. So it was a frame of the film, frame Coca-Cola, frame of the film. So you could see unconsciously, unconsciously you could register the Coca-Cola logo. He told everybody that sales increases with, increased with 52 and 48 percent. He also had popcorn in, in popcorn ad in, in, in the same movie. But in the end, it turned out to be as fake as possibly could. So if you, if you feel like drinking a beer, that's possible because I showed a Dutch beer brand. But, but no, no, no Coca-Cola. I have one raised hand and... Which beer brand did you show? Because I didn't see it. Uh, it was a green, white, and red something beer brand. No, that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you. So the question is, could you apply the peak angle to text? Yes, you can. Can I give you an example? It's right now. It's pretty difficult, um, but. Um, you could extract a sentence down to what's most important, what's something that you want to tell, and how do you want to end. So you could change the order of words, for instance. Sometimes you want the most important part to be at the front of the sentence, so that could be your peak, and then you make sure that you have, and it's, 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 here's the peak, and you want to end posit positively, for instance. So that's, that's how you could apply the peak and in, in a sentence. But, but it's a difficult one, and we try to do it, but it takes us three brains at the office to, to really put the peak and rule into one sentence. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid you ran out of time. So no, I saw one question. I want to ask you to see if I answer correctly, because I think what you could do is, uh, if I understand the rule correctly, is uh, you say, uh, well, yeah, I could help you with that, but it's going to cost more. Or you could say, it's going to cost more, but I can definitely help you with that. Would that be yeah, so there's an example, and the example, I'm going to repeat it. Um, it is costly, but I can help you with that. It's going to cost more, but I can help you with that. Or uh, I can help you with that. It's going to cost more. Whether that's an application of the peak, Andrew, and it's, it's, it's close. And, but that really depends on what you want to highlight. Is it about the cost or is it about you helping them? And so, yeah, it, 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 it's close. So maybe it's close. Thank you. Um, are you going to apply for the bar grant? If you put your yeah, please, please put all your stickers you on our... We more about Neuromarketing, if you think it's interesting, put stickers on his application. We have a live performance. I'd love to do a live 
analysis of several websites. So if you have any stickers left, please put them on. No, I just put them on. So uh, <laughs> big applause for Eva again.